All right, so hello and welcome back. So today we're going to take a look at the Battle of the Drobok Sound, 1940, which, uh, fun fact, is where <laughs> the Blucher was sunk, the Admiral Hipper class ship. So we're going to react basically to the uh, invasion of Norway with a little special caveat, if I can get it to work. We will see. But let us continue. The original video is in the description. I would suggest you go watch that one if you want, you know, a nine minute video instead of whatever I turn this one into. Thank you to you if you're watching and if you like the video, like and subscribe. Otherwise, thanks to my Patreons. Let's continue. It's a cool and quiet April evening at Oscarsborg Fortress. Colonel Birger Eriksson of the Norwegian army takes his time strolling down the pathway and looking as thick mist slowly descends down the nearby hills that encompassed the Oslo Fjord. The colonel is just about to end his regular inspection before going to have some well-deserved rest. The calm atmosphere is suddenly spurred into energy as one of his officers catches up to him and gasps his report. A flotilla of enemy warships has breached into the fjord some 60 kilometers to the south, bringing war to Norway. It's the middle of December of the year 1939. After the successful invasion of Poland a couple of months earlier, the German High Command focuses on replenishing material and manpower losses, in addition to sketching out plans for the following year's campaign to the West. At the same time, German leaders also become increased. So Fall Gleb and Fall Rot obviously are the invasions for um, the Netherlands and the low, basically the Lowlands and the invasion of France. A fall, Gel Gel Ugh, fall. fall Weiss was for the invasion of Poland. I know I'm saying the obvious, but I mean, there it is. Following year's campaign to the West. At the same time, German leaders also become increasingly aware of the British readiness to infringe on the neutrality of Norway and Sweden in the event of any hostile German activity in the area. Such British action will not only curb the potential of the Kriegsmarine by capturing some strategic naval bases on the Norwegian coast, but also be a severe blow to the German war economy Due to insufficient domestic supply, the German industry was heavily dependent on shipments of Swedish iron ore being moved through the ports of Lullio and Narvik. Thus, the German planners were urged to lay out another offensive operation, but this time to the north. Though initially of relatively low priority, the German invasion plan picked up momentum in mid-February of the next year. Operation Westenbank, and also, uh... I think it's later. Norway has a lot of heavy water, which is what you need for uh, one of the things you need for the nuclear bomb. Um, but it became, can be used also in, in different industrial means. Norway has a plant of this, and the Germans will use it until Norwegian commandos blow it up. Um, and Swedish and the Swedish iron ore is actually very critical to Germany. And Sweden's a kind of uh, iffy neutral kind of supporting whoever gives them money. What we're doing. When the British destroyer flotilla intercepted the German oil tanker Altmark in the Norwegian fjord and freed 300 British prisoners of war previously captured by the Kriegsmarine on the southern Atlantic. This incident, where both Allied and Axis forces violated Norwegian neutrality, convinced Hitler that the British threat to German interests in the region was real. And the Altmark incident, basically, there were some Norwegian ships following them, if I remember correctly, but Basically, they, he, the Altmark stopped, and they can't do this in Norway, um, in a fjord, to escape the British, because they knew if they went in there, the British couldn't follow them. The British got their orders. They're like, do not let that ship leave with our people on it. They violated Norwegian neutrality then, and took the prisoners back. That's what happens in war. <laughs> Violations of neutrality happen. And so now that you know Hitler basically says, oh, they can violate your neutrality. We will come and protect you, is basically the justification for what they're about to do. And so an invasion of Norway was given top priority. In the beginning of April, the preparation period was over. The invading force was organized into six battle groups to perform amphibious assaults on six primary targets, among them the capital city of Oslo. These camp group are basically just groups of men. They're not it's a very German kind of system, but basically a Kampfgruppen is just a group of whatever you have at the time. Here the main German objective was to capture King Horkon alongside the Norwegian cabinet in a surprise strike and subsequently install a puppet government in place of the old one. 
The nautical path to the Norwegian capital led through the Oslo Fjord, a 100 km long inlet naturally divided into two sections. The entrance to the inner part of the fjord was guarded by Oskarsborg, a 19th century coastal fortress with its main defensive facilities located on two small islets and equipped with three Krupp manufactured 28 cm coastal defense guns, which were, just like the entire fortress, well past their prime. A few supporting... These are 11 inch guns is what this means, in case you don't know what centimeters for the thing are, which I don't because I'm American. Batteries armed with 15 cm and smaller caliber guns were situated nearby on the mainland. In addition, by 1940, Oskarsborg served primarily as a training facility and was only supplied with limited troops. In the night between the 8th and 9th of April, Oskarsborg commander, 65-year-old Colonel Birger Eriksson, received an urgent message. 65 years old, wow. You are forced to retire in the U.S. Army and you get that old. Really old for, I guess, a colonel, because again, it's the Norwegian Army. It's probably like as high as you can go. It's not very big. That an unidentified group of warships forced their way into the fjord, past the outer fortifications. He immediately ordered the raising of the alarm and the manning of the guns. Despite having three loaded artillery pieces at his disposal, he had barely enough trained men to crew two of them as he only received a few hundred fresh conscripts just seven days before. Think about that. Just seven days before, you're like, oh, imagine yourself picked out seven days. Boop. Oh, you know how to fire an artillery gun of 11 inches? Yeah, mm-hmm. Yeah, sure, sure. <laughs> it's very complicated. The night was calm and foggy, only occasionally lit by beams cast by the searchlights. As time passed by painfully slow, the Norwegian crew patiently waited until enemy warships loomed out of the fog. At 4.20 in the morning, Norwegian searchlights picked up the silhouette of the first ship steaming towards them from a few kilometers away. It was the time for Colonel Eriksson to decide whether to engage or to let them through. It wasn't an easy decision to make, as he could only guess at whether the invaders were British or German. He was well aware of Norway's neutrality, but he also knew that the Norwegian government leaned towards joining the British side in the event of Norway becoming involved in the war. Enemy warships were drawing closer, past the two-kilometer mark. Gunnery officers watched the old commander carefully. That was when Colonel Eriksson, hesitating no longer, gave the order by saying, either I will be decorated or I will be court-martialed. Fire! That's a badass quote attributed to him. And again, wanting to side with the British here. Uh, but there are ships coming in. They are more than likely German if they're coming straight for the capital. The British would, you know, do something else. I mean, send diplomatic people. It'd be something else. The first high-caliber gun roared, lighting up the surroundings for a brief moment. The high-explosive shell hit one of the masts, crippling the main range finder and setting the midship on fire. Giving the enemy no time to react, the second gun thundered, striking near the aircraft hangar and igniting a second major fire. Though the defenders did not learn this straight away, the ship they had shelled was the Blucher, the German brand new Admiral Hipper class heavy cruiser and the flagship of the task force dispatched to attack Oslo. The fires quickly spread on board the Blucher detonating some of the infantry explosives she carried, while Norwegian mainland batteries scored additional hits on the German heavy cruiser as she steamed forward. The second ship in the line, another heavy cruiser, the Lutzau, was soon hit several times by Norwegian medium-caliber artillery, causing serious damage and forcing her and the rest of the task force to reverse their course and escape the fjord. Me. Remember, the Blucher has a task force commander on it and a whole bunch of troops with their ammunition. Why the Germans thought they could just, oh, I don't know, stroll up through Norway, through a fortress without even... They had paratroopers. They had commandos. Could have used them to take out the Oskarsberg fortress. But no, let's just drive a ship straight up the fjord, see what happens with an artillery fortress there. Meanwhile, the Blucher, with violent fires raging on board, had already passed the main Norwegian battery and was just about to encounter another unexpected disaster. The Germans were well informed regarding the Oskarsborg's defensive installations, 
but deemed them mostly harmless on account of the installations being primarily used as a training facility. What the Germans weren't aware of, however, was the underground torpedo battery, Oskarsborg's secret weapon, equipped with 40-year-old Whitehead torpedoes of Austro-Hungarian manufacture. Though nobody was sure if this obsolete armament would work as intended. It's 40 years old, made by the Austro-Hungarians, torpedoes. Do you remember the Austro-Hungarian Navy? Yeah. <laughs> That's also the funniest Austro-Hungarian torpedoes about to hit a German heavy cruiser. It's kind of ironic. The retired commander of the battery, Captain Anderson, ordered that they be fired anyway. The first torpedo hit the bow section of the German cruiser, causing only some minor damage. But the aim of the second torpedo was better adjusted, and the projectile hit midship roughly where one of the 28 centimeter shells had struck a couple of minutes earlier. The Blucher started to take water, causing her to list heavily to the port side. Firefighting teams struggled to contain the fire, and soon flames reached the ship's secondary ammunition magazines. Yet another violent explosion damaged the structure of the German cruiser. With no other choice, the task force commander on board the Blucher gave the order to abandon the sinking ship. Three hours later, in the early morning of the 9th of April, the Blucher capsized and went down to the bottom of the Oslo Fjord, taking with her the bodies of between 500 and 1,000 sailors and invading troops. Dis utter, utter disaster that was. It's a, that's a, that's a, I'll let him finish. But Despite the setback in Oslo Fjord, the German war machine continued to move forward against Norway. Oskarsborg was the subject of heavy bombing from the Luftwaffe later that day, forcing Colonel Eriksson to eventually surrender the fortress. The invading troops landed further south, in considerable distance from the capital, but out of the range of Norwegian coastal defences. The unexpected resistance mounted by the crew of the Oskarsborg fortress not only destroyed one of the bigger and newest warships of the Kriegsmarine, but crucially delayed the German invasion of Oslo by several precious hours, during which, with national gold reserves secured, the royal family and the Norwegian cabinet were able to escape north, where they could mount the defense of their homeland for the next two months. It is monotonic. That is a absolute planning failure on every single level to just leave a fortress and sail straight up the strait with the fortress that you know is there, but you think is harmless, harmless. That's just monotonic and it cost them a lot of lives. And it also, the king and the entire cabinet were able to escape because a few good men were able to do their job and hold and basically fire on the invading forces and that were invading their country and able to actually evacuate the cabinet and the king and the gold. All right, so we're gonna read these and then I have a little special thing we'll do. Despite his efforts to delay German invasion, Karl Erikson came under his criticism of government investigators just after the war ended, who claimed that he surrendered Oskarsberg Fortress earlier than what was necessary. The charges were eventually dropped, and Erikson was awarded Norwegian's decoration war, war cross with a with sword. I don't know the story about that, but I mean, he was under bombardment. I mean, he was literally going to be able to do nothing else besides that. As a nominal commander of the torpedo battery at Oskarsberg on sick leave at the time, German uh, of the German attack, Colonel Erickson summoned retired Captain Anders and Andres Anderson, living nearby at Drombark, to take over the command of the fortress secret weapon hours before the Blucher came into range of the Norwegian guns. For his valor, Captain Anderson was also decorated with a war cross with swords. The Battle of Do uh, Dauber Dorbach Sound is featured in the King's Choice, a 2016 biological war film. Directed by Eric Pope, the movie plot revolves around the German invasion from the perspective of King Harkon and the Norwegian War family, which we are going to go see right now if I can and YouTube didn't block it. So we're going to get my reaction to that too. So let's go there. Now we're going to see it from my actual movie's perspective of the same event that we just uh, reacted to. So. Obviously, Commander Erickson's looking, right? Spotlight is going out.
To them! Avstand! To them! Oreograf melder 1800 meter oberst. Det er alt for mye. De passerer jo nettopp småskjær. Vi avventer bekreftelse fra Koppås. Nei, vi har ikke tid. Sett, 1200 meter! Avstand, 1200 meter! 1200 meter og synke det! 1200 meters for en artillery gun of 11 inches is insane. Ingen varsel, ingen nørling. Dette er fiender. Insanely close. The barrel's basically 90 degrees, but... Da må vi ta feil. Kanon er i posisjon! Kom inn, kommando! Ill! Kanon er! Ill! That one hit the mast. Ill! Kanon 2! Ill! Hit midships. Hit the enemy. Yeah, absolutely devastating on the crews. Hopefully, why you don't sail up a, a ravine to a capital that is definitely defended by a fortress? I well, uh, hope you guys like my reaction to that and the whole video by Baz. And then, of course, the King's Choice, which I'll link below. So, other than that, I hope you people have a nice day, and I'll see you around.